Welcome to Audio Branding, the hidden gem of marketing. Sound plays a more important role in human behavior and our decision-making than you may realize. In this podcast, I'll help you understand the art and science of sound so you can better influence others in business and your life. I'm your host, Jody Krangle. Let's delve a little deeper. I'm curious as to how you feel about uh, the audio branding aspect of this and how clients might want to use synthetic or AI, uh, not just of voices, but of all sorts of things in their audio branding. Do you think that can be an effective strategy? How like how detailed would that get? Yeah, I don't know. Certainly. And in, in fact, um, interestingly enough, uh, just a couple of months ago, I published um, a paper in the Journal of Psychology and Marketing with Charles Spence, who you may know is head of the Crossmodal Research Lab at Oxford. And Charles and I often work on uh, academic proposals quite often. And uh, we basically wrote a narrative review um, kind of bringing practices from science, from the cognitive sciences, from psychoacoustics, from cross-modal science, uh, to bear on the creativity of developing sonic identities. And so there was a section where we talked about AI, and we talked about AI um, from, from two aspects. One is the aspect of uh, research and development. So we could very easily see a world where, you know, based on training sets, you could use AI to feed audio into it and basically be able to tell you, um, is this piece of music or these sonic choices um, aligned with a congruent representation of a particular color or a particular scent or particular value value. So, yeah. So, um, as you're, as you're in development, it, it could be a very quick gut check to kind of see where you're going. Are there ways that you can optimize things? So, so that's a piece of it. One of the other things that we talked about was that, uh, there is a, a movement to look at, um, the development of, AI as uh, synthetic data. So in that instance, very often when we're testing, we're testing with human panels, but there's been some research done, uh, particularly in branding and marketing, where we've seen some results where we've gotten really close to AI duplicating the results that we would get from a human panel. And the benefits there would be, again, if you're wanting to move quickly and you want to mitigate costs that sometimes can come from using a really large sample, uh, AI can help us do that. And we also discussed creative tools where if you do have the training sets where AI is able to identify here are sonic properties that could align with these brand properties and could we then textually ask AI to develop a brand theme or to develop uh, a series of prototypes, um, it could certainly produce that. Now, I think the caveat, and we did talk about this in, in, in terms of limitations, are, you know, again, there's this question of copyright and are there potential problems there? Mm -hmm. um, but also the fact that, uh, you know, AI, at least right now, uh, is really adept um, at iteration, but not so adept at innovation. So it's, I think it's really good at augmenting the so creative inspiring. process. Yeah, inspiring, mm -hmm. but not necessarily great at, um, you know, coming up with something with all the, the nuances that, again, at a subconscious level, we might, might pick up on. Uh, so I could see AI used in advertising to very quickly um, generate mocks or, or ideas that then uh, 
humans, you know, that we call it, it's the human in the loop or the human out of the loop, humans in the loop could then take and build on, you know, or use it as a way to say, well, AI may produce the more generic ideas. So whatever the AI is coming up with, maybe those are the areas where, you know, as, as Miles Davis said, don't play what's there, play what's not there. Yeah. What do we learn from the AI to drive us to the spaces that are not there? You know, I, a I know a, I know a strategist that that's what he and his team use AI for that when they're working on campaigns, they'll have the AI generate ideas and then they steer clear from all of those ideas. They go, they go, <laughs> in those another, are the obvious yeah, they ones. go in another direction. Yeah. Um, and that's uh, very clever, actually. <laughs> yeah. So I, I really do think it's it's understanding what AI can do and what it can't do, how we as artists and creators um, can use that AI as part of our creative process. Uh, and I think we can also learn from history. I mean, these questions that we're asking now are questions that continually get asked every time there's a new iteration of technology uh you know with with recording technology um with the format wars in the early days of of cylinders versus uh you know the the vinyl discs and you know interestingly enough the reason why we have lps today instead of cylinders is because you could pack more LPs, you know, more flat discs, and the breakage was less than the cylinders. So that was basically why. It wasn't necessarily okay. that vinyl was better quality <laughs> than, than a cylinder. Um, yeah. And, you know, when we got to, to, to stacking things, when we got into, um, you know, MP3s and, and is that going to destroy the music business? Well, you know, we see the impact. Yes, there's going to be impact. I mean, I oh, yeah. lived in Nashville for 30 years and when digital audio workstations came out and people were able to do more recording at home, we saw the, Im- the negative impact on recording studios. Um, you know, as you can begin to use synthetic instruments in a way that can imitate an orchestra, you know, maybe you can get a lot, get by with having one violin sessionist come in and do a little bit of sweetening on your track, but did you don't have to order, you know, get a whole orchestra. You don't need to hire a mastering engineer to master your track. Um, and when I was in Nashville, we had these uh, demo farms, essentially. Oh, that, yes. You know, I songwriters. Songwriters yeah. would would sit in a room with a guitar, write a song, and then they would send their little vocal guitar demo into these uh, factories, if you will. Session players would spit out, um, you know, a finished demo that very often became the thing that you would take into the studio mm-hmm. after the artist said, oh, I'm going to cut that song. And there were hooks. Uh, there were arrangements that were so good on those demos, they simply repeated them uh, mm-hmm. in in the studio with the session musicians. That could be the way we're using AI. It would just be yeah. even more cost effective than hiring session players to do the, the demo. So, you know, I... I think uh, again i'm off on a on another tangent because i babble well, on as a brook but it's that <laughs> yeah it's that that idea that yes we can use ai in developing sonic identities mm-hmm. but uh, again the question is thinking through what are the impacts what are the benefits what are the costs um and understanding what are the questions we need to be asking because i think that I think that's the hard part. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, the we we have ways of researching to get to the answers, but you always have to start with the question. And I think sometimes maybe we ask the wrong the wrong question. Uh and that has an, has an impact on getting data that maybe isn't steering us where we need to go. Yeah, a very good point. And actually one that I wanted to ask you about, because it's been so long since we spoke, we had this whole little thing called a pandemic in between there. <laughs> right. 
<laughs> so, so I'm I'm curious as to like where things have changed from before the pandemic to after now in the research that you're doing on sound in where all of this is going. Like, has it changed direction? Do you think from where it started before the pandemic? Well, I mean, certainly we saw effects during the pandemic. It was it was mm -hmm. interesting. You know, I was actually part of a of a small working group of global researchers that were, you know, basically we we built a, for lack of a better word, a, a shared folder, a spreadsheet where we would go in and anything that we would see uh, in in press or research that was being done about music in the time of COVID, we would mm -hmm. put it in there It started looking for for trends. Certainly, you know, with our data at at Pandora and our listener data, we could kind of see where trends um, were taking us. And I think, you know, one of the things that we saw in a way that I think as researchers, we knew, but we we saw it um, amplified was this idea uh, of music operating as a social surrogate where it really does trigger responses in us similar to uh, responses to an empathetic friend uh, where we would use music not just in terms of nostalgia to remind us of happier times, but that music became this friend, particularly in a lockdown oh, where, yeah. you know, it could help us experience the melancholy that was there. We could lean into it or help pick us up. And, you know, we, we turned to music in that way. And certainly we, you know, there were all the, the stories of people, um, you know, going out on their balconies, singing together. You know, we know the power of oxytocin that happens when we sing together, when we move together as a group in time with music. And, and that creates more pro-social behavior. And we, we feel more connected, uh, you know, and in a longing to connect with each other in periods of isolation, music and sound became very powerful there. Now, on the other side of the pandemic, you know, I don't know that we're, you know, our, our behaviors have changed as much as maybe we understand the power of music uh, in, a, in a little different, different way. Uh, again, I think probably more, there's been more impact on how we listen to music and how we create music that's been driven more by technological developments. You know, another example, you know, thinking back in, in history, um, when uh, YouTube became a primary source for music discovery and, and people were going to YouTube and discovering music, there was music on YouTube. Some of the policies around how residuals would get played were built around, you had to, uh, you know, be listening uh, for a certain amount of time mm -hmm. before that performance royalty would kick in. And what we started seeing were producers and writers beginning to modify their approach for a YouTube format where they needed to keep people hooked long enough to start seeing a royalty generated. So we saw the introductions to songs shortening. We saw getting to hooks happening much faster. We saw leaning into vocal hooks early on mm -hmm. uh, in a piece of music happening. And we're seeing that happen again with, with TikTok. Uh, and, you know, trying that started to- started with the radio format, yeah, didn't it? Uh, well, yeah, certainly, you know, there was, there was how we were, um, you know, adjusting songs to appear on the on the radio and for yep, certain three minutes for, for certain links. <laughs> yeah. And now we're down to to seconds and on TikTok yeah. where you've got these short little snippets. You know, this is this is like this is the gold that from a commercial standpoint, if you're really attempting to make money, you're going to be looking for what are these 
sonic memes, if mm-hmm. you will, that are going to go viral and get you that that attention. Um, and how do you spit those things out fast enough uh, to capitalize on it? So I think those are the things that are affecting our um, our our creativity. And then it's also affecting our our listening habits. You know, oh, I, yeah. I'm surprised at how, you know, when I've I've been exposed to songs that I haven't heard before on TikTok, and then I go to find the the song in the marketplace, I'm like the, the tempo is wrong. You know, because there's ah, this tendency to speed things up on on yeah. on TikTok. So mm-hmm. there's a way in which you know it's it's affecting our our listening behavior, um, you know, the way we hear things, the way we hear voices. I think TikTok uh, normalized kind of that uh, synthetic uh, voice that was often used um, as a speech to text yes. function. Um, you know, it's normalized that. It's normalized some of those speech to, te- to text functions in other ways that is um, benefiting the adoption of uh, AI voices. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's all behavioral and, mm-hmm. and it's all tied to, to these habits that we're developing as we interact with these devices and the technology for better yeah. or for worse. <laughs> Very much so. Yeah. There's even a way that people on YouTube talk like yes. people who do videos on, on YouTube, like yep. there's a certain YouTube way of speaking. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and <laughs> so, that's, that's actually been documented, you know, in the, yes. in the same way there was the, do you remember the millennial whoop, uh, <laughs> that there were the, all these songs that were coming out with these yeah. vocal phrases that were just yeah. like, Hey, whoop, whoop. And, you know, they kind of identified the phrase enough that they called it the millennial whoop. And it was, it was a thing. It was like, yeah, really prevalent in a lot of, a lot of music around that period. Oh, so much going on. Yeah. And it's interesting to me that during a time of the pandemic, we needed human connection and then developed AI. <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. What? I mean, what? <laughs> the, the, the AI was there before. I mean, it was, uh, yes, you know, but, but it wasn't in as much use yeah, as there, it is. There was, yeah, the, the, the conditions of the environment made it so that... Yeah. You know, in a longing for companionship, we leaned into these tools even uh-huh. more. And again, this is not always negative. I mean, I, I think there are uses of AI that we see um, with elderly folks. Um, oh, totally. You know, uh, there are good things. Definitely. Yeah. And, and yeah. so uh, it goes back to what I was saying earlier about being mindful about the implications for the use beyond just the application of the use. And those things are, they're difficult to talk about because they're fuzzy, they're hard to nail down. They take time to look at and to measure. And in a world where we're very often driven by, um, you know, how do I get to point A, from point A to point B as quickly as possible um, when we're kind of measuring short-term benefits uh, you know, as, as opposed to the long term, uh, you know, there's, there's this, this rush to things that sometimes keeps us from finding the harm that could be done yeah. over time. I, I think we need to be careful with this because I would much rather be the one composing the music rather than the computer doing that for me. You know, like, I I don't want to be the one who has to clean my house. (laughs) I would rather the technology figure out how to clean my house while I make the music, not the other way around. (laughs) Right. But I think that speaks to the point of finding out what is it that AI does really well. And in terms of your own creative workflow, uh, you know, it goes back to another kind of internal experiment we did, uh, you know, uh, probably about um, a year ago, where we were asking these questions about AI. Uh, You know, everybody's like, is AI going to take our jobs? Um, So we did a little internal competition at Studio Resonate, where we had three teams. One was a human team. We had an AI team. And then we had a hybrid team, human and and AI. Uh, The teams got a brief. They had to execute um, 
uh, two audio spots based on that brief. And then we devised three rounds of evaluation. One, each team had to pitch the idea to um, a media company and to a human at a media company. Mm -hmm. uh, then their output was judged by a panel of creative directors and folks who had actually judged audio competitions. And then the last uh, round was quantitative testing on uh, Veritonic's uh, audio testing platform. And if this started initially to see, okay, well, how is the AI team going to perform over the human team? But the real value for us came in the fact that we had all the team members, there was, there were two leaders of each team. So a, a, a creative director and then a producer, and we had them keep uh, journals and then in the debrief, as we went through the journals, we found that the real value of this was less about, you know, is AI a collaborator or a competitor, and more about how do we manage talent in an age of AI? And one of the, one of the things out of one of the, the journals from one of the producers was that um, they were working on the hybrid team. And they had this goal of never working with AI. So we, we threw them into a situation where, you know, they, they had to do it. And what they found was that there were some things that the AI was doing that was the part of the job that they didn't want to do. And that it actually freed them up to concentrate on the things that they wanted to do more. Uh, and so it, it was through the exposure and playing with these tools that we learn how they work, what works for us. And, you know, that's why my advice to any creator is play around with these tools, learn how to use them, find where it fits in your creative workflow, where it doesn't. Because I think, um, you know, and this is not an original comment, for me, a lot of people are saying it. It's at this point, it's not whether or not AI is going to take your job. It's probably not, but somebody who knows how to use AI probably will. Yeah. Uh, so, so that's the that's that's the the takeaway. All of that. Yeah, it's a really good point. My curiosity would be who out of those three ended up with the job? Like who won? <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, you know, that's always the 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 question. Um, and what we found was, uh, the results, it was really close, you know, folks were, uh, really all over the map, uh, in, in the analysis at the end, you know, the live individual that we were pitching things to, uh, he wanted to guess who the teams were. He got all of them wrong. Uh, okay. <laughs> the, uh, judges, you know, we, we, we had some judges that would say the AI team was the most human thing that they heard. The human team was the most AI thing that they heard. Um, and, uh, probably the, the only, uh, one that would have been the results I would have guessed, uh, was the quantitative analysis where the AI, uh, performed really well against the human and the hybrid team on the spot that was designed for kind of a short-term call to action okay. approach. Yeah. On the brand-based spot, which is really a bit more about emotional connection, uh, the human team won uh, there, but just by a hair. Okay. So at the end of the analysis, when we put all of it together, um, the AI team came out on top. Really interesting. Okay. But, yes, but this is where this is where you know people need to understand that the way we organized this, this wasn't something where we just inputted a prompt and we got a an audio spot out. Mm -hmm. We had a. Uh, you know, uh, two humans involved with the AI team. And the rule for the AI team was that, uh, you know, there were certain tools that they could use for voice synthesis, for scripting, um, 
for generating visuals that would be used in the in the pitch uh, and uh, fr from the standpoint of music, all of that needed to be AI or, or AI influenced. Um, the only place where we made a, a little bit of allowance was on the music side, because this was before, you know, early we spoke about some of the tools and how advanced they are now. Those tools didn't exist. I see. And yeah. the music tools weren't that good. And so I gave the uh, AI team a little bit of leeway there. And I said, first thing I want you to do is to try the programs that AI produces. If it's just really not usable, let's go to an AI music library. And if that still is just not even at an acceptable level, then you could use music from our music library, but the you have to figure out a way that the AI is choosing it. You're not choosing it. Okay, interesting. Yeah. Wow. That is uh... so. Where they got where they got creative was they went through the steps. They couldn't find anything that was either generated by AI or from an AI based library that was usable. Mm -hmm. At this point, the AI through their prompting had already generated the script. They already had timings. Um, they already had, you know, the AI kind of putting in where they needed lifts in the music or whatever. And so they had the AI compose an email to the music supervisor at the music library telling the music supervisor what the AI needed for its spot. The music supervisor wrote back to the AI, not knowing that it was AI, uh -huh. and basically said, I don't think we really have anything in our library that's exactly what you want, but I have a composer that's available here, so I'm just going to have him write something for you. <laughs> so they <laughs> sent that back. And it was exactly what it needed to be. So I felt like, okay, that's close enough for the exercise. It was the AI was prompting the humans. That's pretty clever. To, yeah. get, to get the output that it needed. So one of the things that I say, because it, when we present this live and we do, you know, we reveal the results live, we go through a series of here's the lessons that we learned and here's the implications for managing your talent in an age of AI. Mm -hmm. And one of the... One of the rules uh, that I uh, pulled out of this was what I call uh, Maverick's Maxim that uh, speaks to Pete Maverick Mitchell from Top Gun. Okay. Uh, who said, uh, who said, it's not the plane, it's the pilot. And so I think this speaks to the importance of humans being in the loop. Yes. That even though the AI team was general, everything was essentially generated by AI or prompted from AI in the, in the, the case of the music. But we did have a human producer and a human creative director that was basically directing the AI. If we had changed the leaders of the teams, there might have been a different outcome. Uh, so I, I think that's why that's why when we talk about what we learned from this, it was less about, you know, is is AI going to take our jobs and more about the value of humans working with AI and learning how to use these tools. Um, but I do think there's also the recognition that the tools are good enough now um, that they work really, really well for us. Yeah, that's uh, quite a demonstration there. Yeah, uh, really interesting, too. Steve, there is so much more that I could talk to you about. <laughs> I I definitely at some and point... And there's so much more that I could say. <laughs> I know. I Like, I, I definitely have wanting, wanted to ask you about the, the influence of sound on our taste buds, because I know that you have done probably yes. more on that. Uh, right now, we don't have time, but maybe we could get another one of these in the books and, and answer some more of those questions because there is so much more to talk about. <laughs> but wow. Yeah, well, and, uh, you know, I'm passionate about this. So once you get me started, uh, you, you have a problem getting me to 
to stop. That so is what we'll I was stop counting and on. We'll pick it up again somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no problem. I was counting on that. Thank you. Yeah, this was fantastic. Thank yeah. you so much for coming back. And hopefully we will do this again. You're Can you welcome. let people know how to get in touch with you if they need to do that? Where they sure. can see what you're working you know, they, on? You, you can... You can you can easily find me on LinkedIn. Uh, so just, you know, look for Steve Keller and, you know, maybe prompt with uh, Audio Alchemist uh, and you'll you'll find me there. Um, you know, you can reach out to me, uh, steve.keller at SiriusXM.com um, and get in touch with me that way. But uh, by following me there and also certainly checking out uh, StudioResonate.com where you can have access to our blog and all the wonderful things that all of my team members here are doing uh, that is really elevating the use of audio uh, in advertising that's a great way to kind of keep up with some of the things that we're doing. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Steve. I really appreciate you coming here today. Oh, you're and I welcome. Hope that, Thank yeah. you for engaging the conversation. <laughs> I'm happy to do so, and I hope we can talk more. <laughs> you know where to find me. Well, that's the end of this episode. Thanks for listening. And if you like what you heard, why not tell a friend about this podcast? It's available in all the usual locations. Until next time, 